Okay, welcome to Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players. Special guest today, Toby Elliott. Uh, Toby, tell, tell the folks who you are, what's your background with Magic. Wow, so, so I started playing Magic back in 1993 with Alpha. Um, I have been playing continuously ever since. I got involved with the Judge program in 1999-2000. Um, back in the PTQ days, when you won a PTQ, you weren't allowed to play any more PTQs for the summer. I won the first one for Urza's Legacy. I was like, well, now what am I going to do? And I'm like, this judging thing seems kind of interesting. So I became a judge. That actually worked out way better than my pro career. Um, <laughs> I have been a judge since 2000. I was at one point a level five. Uh, there aren't only three levels now. Um, so I'm a level three at the moment. Um, I'm generally the person in charge of the tournament documents. That means any of the rules documents that apply when you're in a tournament from your FNM all the way up to the Pro Tour, except the actual comprehensive rules. Um, so the tournament rules, the infraction procedures, and the uh, judging at regular REL are all documents that I maintain, edit, and work with the Wizards team on updating periodically. Okay, cool. And, and the Wizards, ha Wizards has their own team on like the core game rules aside from yeah. the tournament rules, so it's kind of, there are the rules of the game, and there are the rules of like, the tournament. Is that a yep. fair, way, fair way of saying it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the rules that you actually need. The, this, the comprehensive rules are essentially the mathematical structure of magic. Um, they are, you could take the cards and the comprehensive rules, and you could play a game of magic. Uh, the tournament rules are everything that's needed on top of that to actually run an event. How you pair things, how you pod players, how, you, how players are expected to behave, what happens when they do something wrong. Those are all things that cover... Because they're outside of sort of the mathematical rules of magic. So the, the comprehensive rules are entirely inclusive. They cover absolutely everything that you could possibly happen in a game of magic. The, the other parts of the tournament documents have to be more flexible. Because you can't say, well, these are the only things that can happen. Because literally anything can happen in a magic tournament. And as we know from many years of experience, anything can and does happen. So... Yeah. They have to be written in a way that is much more flexible about how to handle things. Um, they're not; they can't be sort of as mathematically precise as the comprehensive rules can. Great, and, and we're gonna um, we're gonna unpack that <laughs> exactly in, in, in all its beautiful detail in a moment. Um, so that's great. And and you and I, just so folks know, I mean, obviously, I'm not meeting you for the first time. We've been talking about <laughs> magic rules issues oh, and so you know long. hot topics for a long, long time. I don't know who knows how long, probably over ten years easily, oh, but. Um, with this trample thing came up and actually someone had brought up, oh, well, there's actually, l let me go look at the Magic Judge blog post on this. They found your blog post. Look in the comment section and sure enough, it's you and I. <laughs> the only comment is you and I going back and forth on an exchange. Um, so I've always found, let me just say, I've always found it really um, useful to talk to you. I find that your approach and my approach mesh nicely. I think we both kind of show, and I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, we both show up thinking, okay, I probably have something to, something to teach something to learn, kind of exchange of information, exchange oh, yeah. of ideas. I can say from experience that certain things you have said and done in the past have definitely influenced policy. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, and you know, because it's, it's just different vantage points. I think someone sitting at the table focused on either not getting cheated or not miscommunicating or understanding what the rules are. Is, it, is this a, a rule that's easy to understand, difficult? You know, mm -hmm. being at the table is one perspective being, you know, training other judges, there's a million different perspectives, right? You've got some of them, I've got some of them. So if we're, if we're talking about these issues, you know, I've just found it useful to understand where is this coming from? Why is that the rule? So having said that, um, and I apologize for, I wanted to put us on a split screen, but Skype, I, did, could, I couldn't figure out how to get this version of Skype to work. That's why I'm a little bit smaller, but I, it's all good. Um, we've got the guest blown up large as it should be. Um, want to dive in now to the issue that brings us here today is that this thing came up regarding trample and the defaults. And so I figured if I could have you on, kind of pick your brain about some of the things that I found tricky and interesting, and then maybe talk about why, why we are where we are right now with the tournament procedures there and communication guidelines, where, you know, where the trade-offs might lie, that sort of thing. So let me just set it up this way. I think the easiest way so people don't have to have the context. I can just go through it as an example. Yeah, go for it. If I attack you, so we're, we're playing a tournament match. Let's say it's a PTQ. I attack you with a creature that's, let's just say it's 5-5 five, five, trample. I'm a, but I, I, sorry, I don't attack you. I attack your planeswalker. Your planeswalker's on 5 loyalty. And let's say that you block with a 2-2. Two, two. So mm. 
And then you put your 2-2 in the graveyard and you go to take your turn. Now, first of all, l l let me take a step back. So as the player who is attacking with the trampling creature, do I have to say something in order to get the damage onto the Planeswalker? How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, you actually don't need the Planeswalker here. This this works perfectly cleanly if I attack you with a 5-5 five, five Trampler and you block with a 2-2. Two, two, and okay. what happens next? Um, and so what happens in that situation is you're you're the I'm sorry I'm the I'm the active player I'm attacking I I need to sort of explain what is happening in the game so you block the two two and we go and I put you know you put your two two in the graveyard because it's got lethal damage on it and we now have essentially an ambiguous situation it's an ambiguous situation that's created by the active player because all the active player has to do at this point is say oh and three damage tramples through and honestly we're not even all that concerned about you have to say it immediately if. Like, you, if, like, the other player immediately sort of takes the turn and starts moving, they go, wait a minute, you also take three. We're, we're going to be totally on board with that. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think what's interesting to look at is if we look at why there was originally a trample shortcut, um, because a lot of people may not know how trample and damage originally worked pre-2010, which is damage used the stack. And so what would happen is I would attack with my 5-5, five five, and you would block with your 2-2, two two and we would say damage on the stack. Now do you giant? Now do you giant growth your two two, or do, do, guess, do you give your two two plus one plus one? Is actually a better example, mm -hmm. because it is unclear from what has been communicated right now. Well, did I apply three dam two uh, two damage to your blocker and three damage to you, or did I apply some other number? So I, as the defending player in 2010 or prior to 2020, could not act based on the information that I had at that time without having to ask a question that probably reveals stuff that I don't want revealed. Right. I have, I have aggressive urge. I can give my guy plus one, plus one. It's very important to me to know how much damage has been done there. But if I ask that question, I'm like, oh, well, I assign all the damage to your 5-5, five, five, you know, or your 2-2, your because two, two, now right, I'm right. protected from your combat trick. And so why we have, and this gets into why we have shortcuts in magic. And we, when, we, when we tend to define a shortcut, it's because... Uh, the, usually the active player has, can create some level of ambiguity in a situation which forces the non-active player to try to make a decision without full knowledge. And if you read through the communication section and all the representation and you look at things like derived information, it's all about a player being able to act with full knowledge, not necessarily full understanding. Those are different things. But they have full knowledge of all the inputs they need to take to assemble a game state. So in the case of Trample in 2010, in that situation, you could not act because you did not know what the situation was. Now we flash forward to post-2010, and in the post-2010 world, there's not this interim step that's created where the player says something and then something happens. The damage is dealt, and then what happens after that is defined by the physical actions taken in the game. So if I attack you with a 5-5 five, five and you block with a 2-2, two, two, I say, and you take 3 or even if you just go and knock three off on your life total and I don't change it, that is a physical change to the game that lets everybody act in a way that there's no surprises, there's no ambiguity involved. I, I can't, as the attacker with the 5-5 five, five Trampler, create any ambiguity in this game state. Yeah, and, and, and I would, you know, I, I know that some things have changed since 2010, but, you know, there's a sense in which a lot is the same. I mean, I attack mm -hmm. with a 4-4, four, four, if you were to block with a three three and a two two, mm -hmm. and then and and I ordered them, you know, three three first, it's the same mm -hmm. kind of thing where in in, the, in that second main phase, there's not really a way to know how much is there one damage or zero damage on the second creature, and so I, even though I yes, I, so it's kind of you kind of end up in the same pickle mm -hmm. even though we're no longer putting damage on the stack. It, you, it, you know, things are a little different, but it's still the same kind of issue. But there, there's not, in that situation, an exploitable ambiguity because you should assume there's a damage on your creature. Um, it, it's it's a, an invisible thing, and this is the problem with paper magic is there's lots mm -hmm. of invisible things to keep track of. But in general, if we, if you attack with a 4, if I attack with a 5-5 five, five and you block with a 4-4 four, four and a 2-2, two, two, um, if you then zap that creature for the last point, nobody's ever going to rule, well, you, know, you, uh, you obviously chose to do the damage the other direction. And in the case of the other situation, the defending player can always protect from that because there's no time in which it's not obvious what is happening in the game. Hmm. 
And so, so yeah, we generally, the active player has incredible amounts of power in a turn of magic. And okay. so we, we lean very hard on, it's the responsibility of the active player during their turn to make sure that things are going, that things are clear and things are going the way they are. And we also look very hard at the physical representation of the game. So if, in the case of Trample now, if you block with a 5, if I block with a, if I attack with a 5-5 five, five, and you block with a 2-2, two, two, and nothing about the physical game changes, I as the active player can recognize that something needs to change and say, hey, you need to take 3 damage. Okay. Whereas it is a legal game state that is correctly physically represented that I've just done 5 damage to your 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, so here's where, I'm, here's where I, I'm, I'm not quite following because... Mm -hmm. So... I want so think of the example where I attack with a five five, you block with a two two. I mm -hmm. don't make any changes because I forgot my creature had trample, right? Right. So let's just say that happened, and now we're in my second main phase, and you know, okay, that's where we are. Now you said earlier that the defending player who who has blocked with a four four and a two two can mm -hmm. now assume there's one damage on that two two. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that they can because how do they know that the, the active player didn't forget? So now when the active player in the second main phase says earthquake for one, mm -hmm. and, and now me as the, as, the, as the player with the 2-2 two -two there that may have one damage, may have zero, if I'm deciding whether to counter that earthquake, I'm in the same spot as the person. Yep. So, so I'm, not sure that I, I'm not sure that there's any assumption. Like there needs to be the default. So what is the default? If I end yeah, up in that spot... I mean that, that is actually a reasonable counterpoint. The, the reason that we haven't sort of addressed that is because it doesn't come up very often. It's usually so unambiguous, but you're, you're correct. There is a little bit of an ambiguity there um, that we sort of hand wave away. Okay. Um, you, you are correct that technically I could not know whether I need to pump the thing, but there's certainly a lot of implications from the game state at that time. Um, it's very, very rare uh, well, another way to look at it is we will assume as the default that you just trampled through as far as you could, but because there is, there's, that's, our, that's our assumption. Until we are shown by the physical representation of the game that something else happened. That's interesting. Okay. So that, yeah. th that, that's really interesting. So it's like, it, even though I'm, I'm coming into this conversation thinking that the current default is you got to kind of say, you have to say what you're doing, you're saying that's only because when things in the game state need to be changed, then you've got to change. That's interesting. Okay. We, 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 do, we do spend a lot of time leaning on visible game state because okay. if, if the game state can be legally explained from the visible state, especially if we like end up talking about this a turn later or two turns later, sure. then we will lean really hard on, well, this is what the game said it is. And in, in, the, in the trample situation when I'm going through to a player, I am hitting the player, and there's a physical change to the game state. Somebody is, and this is why we emphasize writing down life total changes, is because we want that to be an active physical part of the game. And same with Planeswalkers, somebody's removing loyalty counters in some fashion. Right. So, so if, if I forget my trample, and I attack you 5-5 five, five into your 2-2, two, two, and I don't say anything, and you don't take damage, that is a legal game state that has been achieved that is currently represented by the game accurately. Sure. Whereas... If we go to something where we say, well, you actually took three magically, that is, we're now in a situation where the real game state of magic is not correctly represented physically. Yeah, and we, so, uh, so then we get into penalties. So that, that may be the answer to my next question. My next question is, why not have the default in paper match the online default? You know, some computer programmer had to determine that a default, and, and, and online, it's, you know, you're it's going to automatically select two damage onto that 2-2 two -two, since that's lethal yep. and three damage onto the player. Why is that not a better default? And then it becomes like a death touch or lifelink where both players own, like, yeah, this is, this is a creature with trample. So combat works differently, just, just like it would if it had death touch. Like, why is that not the default? <laughs> because digital games don't have invisible information. You can't actually, in Arena, you can't, the active player can never create and then exploit ambiguity. Um, that, that's, I mean, that's the fundamental. Is the same reason you can't you can't miss your triggers online. No, yeah, um, yeah. So like, that's why online. That, that's why it works for online. But why wouldn't it? Isn't why isn't it also the right default for paper? Because that's what players expect to happen when they block a two two. When they block a five five trample with a two two. So why not just take us there as as a default? Sure. And if the player wants to deal five to the two two, they they can let you know. So, so we get into a weird situation there, and this gets into, well, okay, now my 5-5 five five has just dealt three to you, and nobody's marked anything down, because that's the default. Sure, well, that's what happens if I tackle the flyer, and no one writes anything. 
Well, yeah, and but that means that but the difference between the flyer and the trampler is that there is a legal game state that can be achieved with the current life totals as represented. Whereas the flyer, that's illegal. And if you don't take, if, and if a flyer doesn't do damage, and we discover that a turn later, a it's a horrible situation because we hate life total problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also, I mean, that somebody is getting penalized in that situation. Um, yeah. So. We, we're, we get there's a couple of weird situations here. Um, it, it adds to a, the problem of I take actions after the situation. So I attack you my five five trampler. You're you're at four life, let's say, mm -hmm. and you you block with your two two. Nobody says anything. You untap. You you necropotence for for two. And then we go. Oh wait, trample. I call a judge. What happens? Sure. Yeah. Well, now now you're dead. <laughs> And so we we don't we try to avoid fixing life totals that could be legally achieved. Obviously, if you attack the two two flyer, didn't take the damage. Well, now we have an illegal situation, and there's penalties involved, and we have to go and fix it because that is that situation can't happen. Yeah, the trouble situation can happen. So I would say, yeah, I, what you're saying makes sense. I think I think I would say that empirically, when there's this, when, when there's this is when these situations come up. I mean, it's kind of like you know, which is more likely that mm -hmm. this situation where someone has kind of like what happened in the actual incident that came up, right? The planeswalker didn't roll over, but they just kind of assumed like the die would move. And I guess when when it comes up, like the fact that the player, the active player, can see the die, I'm sympathetic mm -hmm. to that. It, it, it makes sense. I just wonder whether it whether it actually wouldn't align better with. Mechanics like lifelink and death touch, the other really combat math impacting mechanics that aren't optional, whether trample was kind of treated like that. I hear what you're saying about what would then happen with these disputes, but I think that's like that's already how lifelink works. That's already yeah. how death touch works. Um, and they're not, they're not awesome. <laughs> well, that that touch is yeah. I mean, yeah, this is this is where we get into situations like you death touch a creature, and a turn later we realize that, and that creature disappears, and that's not good. I mean, yeah. that, that's you've had two players making decisions based on a very represented game state that was inaccurate. And we, I mean, we correct these things, but we hate having to do it because it means that, you know, you, you may have made a suboptimal decision since then. And this is why you, we don't, we only allow backups for a certain period of time because yeah. that is truly hairy after a point. And we, we, we only correct very specific situations. And one of them happens to be if you happen to have killed a death touch creature or you did five damage to a creature and they forgot to bin it, yeah. that's going to fix that. But we'd really rather not because that, that's going to disadvantage somebody who has possibly made a play based on that presence or absence of that creature. Yeah. Um, so, and similarly, if you made a play based on the presence or of, on your life total, yeah, sometimes that will happen. But if we have a situation where we can say, this was legally achievable, and we can, and the active player had all the power. There was no ambiguity to be created. That that's that that to me is a cleaner and safer way of doing it than establishing a shortcut. And, and okay, and, and I want to I want to say that ultimately, I actually agree with that in the sense that I think it's I, I like that it preserves the ability for someone to forget that tramples on their creature. Um, that sometimes, like you know, Paul Paul Rietzel was saying, what like. Sometimes your only out is to block a 5-5 five five with a 1-1 one one when you're at 4 and hope they forget. And right now the way Trample works, you can forget. I also understand that there's actually a majority opinion was it's better to actually just solve for like what's more intuitive. And if it ends up being that people can't really forget Trample, then so be it. But I'm glad we were able to flesh that out, kind of what, what the trade-offs are because... You know, it's not it's not clear to me. I, I can kind of see both arguments, and even though I'm more sympathetic to oh, what sure. you're saying than others, I think other people are being reasonable in, in their pushback on that. No, I, I think it's an absolutely reasonable topic to discuss. Um, it's, I mean, if I had my way and I could wave a magic wand and make people play magic the way I wanted them to play magic, they would take the three damage. Yeah. Um, we, we when we talk about magic a lot, when we talk about we we, we try to avoid talking about unsporting um, because unsporting is very specifically defined. We actually have three categories. We have what we call sporting behavior, which is sort of what we want to encourage, what we like. And sporting behavior here would be the player saying, oh, yeah, I, I take three. Or, yeah, my plan is walkers, take whatever. But we, we, and we have unsporting behavior. And unsporting behavior is very specifically defined by the IPG. It's all the things you're, you know, we will actually penalize you for you can't do. But there's this big middle ground that we call not sporting, mm. which is essentially competitive behavior. And this is the sort of thing that falls into competitive behavior, where we... 
don't we'd rather you were you know sporting about this and good but we acknowledge that this is a competitive game and that you have to like make some compromises to allow for competition and for people to miss things and yeah. for people to make misplays and so that and so that's so I, I, I want to be clear, I don't think this is unsporting behavior, but it's not behavior I would like. I would rather that people were encouraged to acknowledge the trample damage and take it. I just don't think it is realistic that we should require them to. Yeah, that's, yeah and, and that's, that actually leads to what I want to go through next, which is some different scenarios. And you're right that, you know, obviously like <laughs> drawing a distinction between unsporting and not sporting, something that, you know, a, a lawyer and a magic judge, we can all <laughs> appreciate that. I don't know that I don't know that that you know my more um, you know just my more middle of the road listener here is gonna really sit, hear that and say well yeah that, that makes perfect sense I mean it kind of for them for or for a lot of folks that respond to these polls for example there's really a brighter line between that's something that's okay and that's something that's either scummy cheating and some people even will collapse those categories but I'm with you I try to encourage people to kind of let's actually unpack that cheating means one thing. Something that's scummy, angle shoot, unsport. Well, unsporting might mean something, you know, separately. What's scummy or inappropriate? Yeah, and 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 this is sort of what you sign up for when you sign up at a, for a competitive RL tournament. Obviously, at F and M, there's a lot more flexibility about, you know, well, you know, everybody's learning right. the rules, and yeah, you, know, you realize a little, a little bit later you forgot the trample. Oh well, okay, sure, you can have it now, whatever. That everybody's a lot more casual there. But at, when you when you sign up for a competitive event, this is the sort of thing that you're actually signing up for. And, 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 I, and yeah, I think that's true. So that's why in my, ultimately in my, in my earlier video, which I'll link in the description, you know, I ultimately landed on in order to protect yourself, there's a sense in which, yeah, you probably do want to kind of play as if your opponent could forget the creature has trample because otherwise you're going to forget your opponent's not going to give you any, any wiggle room. You're giving your opponent's wiggle room, but there's a lot there. Let's use some different, bring some different examples in. And I want to hear from you. Kind of what the rule, what the rules say. I think that's what we'll be able to most definitively talk about, and then we can certainly talk about. It, okay, well, beyond the rules, would you consider this not sporting or sporting? Sure. So these are from <laughs> at Max Dorshin on Twitter, who had a nice thread about November twenty fifth with some different scenarios. The first one: I cast Delver of Secrets past the turn. My opponent um, pluses their Liliana the Last Hope, and the plus ability up to one creature gets minus two, minus one. They mm -hmm. plus their Liliana the Last Hope and pass the turn. Me, upkeep, Delver trigger. Opponent, your Delver should be dead. Me, you didn't target anything with when you activated Liliana. So how would you, how would you rule as a judge? And, and so what, what are the, I mean, not that much time has passed. How would you rule on those facts? In general... Um, I'm trying to put sequencing this together. My my general my general instinct would be that that's a complete communication failure on the part of the Liliana player. I mean, they plus one their planeswalker and didn't say anything. Yep, that's that's like, and I mean, if they immediately, I mean, this is one where I would I would probably side with the Delver player. That I mean, they've made a legal play. The act, they're the active player. They're they're controlling the turn. Um, I mean, if there were two one ones out, would we ha we even be having this discussion? Um, right. Then it's like I mean, so at that point, I'm like, yeah, you really need to like at least talk about what you're doing. We we want players to communicate. We want players to over communicate. Right. I mean, I, in the ideal world, players are constantly explaining everything. We acknowledge that's impossible and actually slightly painful, <laughs> but. You know, on the whole, we when we're judging, we tend to fa if somebody's been communicating clearly and somebody's been really like ambiguous or not communicating, that's not. I mean, we're generally going to find in favor of the person who has been communicating better. I mean, yeah, that that just seems like a. I mean, I announce this ability, but don't tell you what I'm targeting with it. That and when there's a legal up to one, yep, okay. I, I can't can't get on board with you know that. Okay. I think, uh, unless they catch it themselves, like. Unless they realize they're passing the turn, like, wait, why isn't that thing dead? Then, but if the other guy has to remind him of the existence of this, then it's mm. yeah. I so I agree with you. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised because I, I actually would expect that if I called the judge in this spot in a tournament, that because it's kind of like this happened, then that happened. I, I expect that you're gonna get a lot of like, well, it's almost a take back, or you know, it's miscommunication. So, so I, I wonder about a take back there, except that. It's the other person calling attention to the Delver, and that's that. That sort of means we're out of take back territory. 
Yeah, look, that's interesting. I'm just I'm surprised to hear, it, but I, I I think it's a reasonable ruling. A take back would be a, pl- a plus one Liliana. Your turn. Wait, your guy's dead. That would be a take back. Sure. The point of the take back rulings to me are situations where, in a lot of ways, you shouldn't even really need to call a judge. They're just things that people are like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, yeah. I had one in the, I had one in the last pro tour. My opponent activated their Oko to exchange two permanents, mm-hmm. and I picked up my permanent to give it in the exchange, and then said, "Oh, but I'm gonna tap it for mana, so you get it tapped." And yeah. my opponent, yeah, and my opponent called a judge, and I wasn't upset at the opponent for calling a judge. I, I you know, again, I think you know, I am, I am ultimately gonna be essentially using a take back there. But the judge said, you know, well, we're nothing, no information has been given here. We're, we're gonna yeah, allow a take back during the action. It's fine, yeah. So I, I was last to act, right? So I could, you know, there's not like a, there wasn't like a whole other sequence there. So exactly. it, that's an example. And so for players who do make a mistake like that, and the opponent calls you out on it, don't be afraid to say, to tr- call a judge and say, you know, actually, like, yeah, I didn't do it immediately, or I did it in a slightly wrong order, but here's what I want to do. Can I do that? And judges now will give you some flexibility. I think that's fine. But, but whether it's fine or not, that's how it works, and players should protect right. themselves. But, um, but one of the keys there is that you can't have gained new information. And my announcing the Delver's Secrets trigger is pretty new information at that point. It, yeah. it's, it's announcing to you, you forgot to do something. Okay, here's another one. These are fun. Uh-oh. Um, okay, opponent is playing Food Chain. Food Chain lets you exile a creature as a mana ability and generate some mana. Yep. I know it's a mana ability. I call a judge. <laughs> the judge, yes. Me, and in, in, in the opponent's in full you know, earshot. Judge, can I name Food Chain with Pithing Needle? Oh, lordy. Judge, yes, you can. You can name, you know, the judge says yes or yes, it's, it's, a, it's a legal card to name. Me, Pithy Needle on Food Chain. Um, and the, the, most, of the, most of the respondents thought this is 100% clean play. What do you think about using the judge that way? I think, well, I think it is incredibly hard to make it any other way without it getting really painful. Like, this, this falls into that behavior where I wish, you know, I'd be like, that's awful. But then I like dig into what it means and everything else, and I'm like, yeah, this is actually the only viable solution, mm-hmm. short of because the real danger here is that if if we start giving more flexibility, what ends up happening is that the judges end up coaching in situations where it, yeah, I mean, this this one maybe not, but it, it it introduces flexibility in ways that are a little worrying. Um, and it would be very easy for judges to accidentally get involved in strategic information. I mean, yeah. Pithing Needle is technically a legal target for, or Fruit Chain is yeah. technically a legal target to name for, for Pithing Needle. If your opponent knows the rules, they may just be like, sweet, you just tried to bluff and absolutely failed at it because I'm going to use my food chain now because I also know it's a mono ability. Yeah, I think, yeah, um, I, I agree with you on how it should be ruled. I think that, because like you said, it's kind of like, it's the it's the best of the bad alternatives to really, yeah. to how to deal with it. I, I think I, this is this is one of the few plays where I think it, like, it starts to feel pretty unethical because you're actually asking a judge a question as part, like you're kind of like using the judge's time and energy as part of your bluff, and so I don't like it for that reason. It, it feels icky to me, mm-hmm. more so than like the Liliana play or, or the the Oko trample damage play because you're just again, I just I worry about it, but ultimately I think it's a clean play from a rules perspective. I mean, my general take, and I agree, this is this is what we consider non-sporting. Um, and my general belief here is that if you are non-sporting often enough, people start to know. Mm. Um, and so you will get, a, if, you, if you do that play, which is a fairly public play, you call a judge over, you know, it, it's not like, you know, you just let something slide and nobody ever noticed. This is a, yeah. you, you engage in the judge and stuff. That's the sort of thing where people will start to be like, oh, that guy, he's the one who really likes to abuse the loopholes. And in the long run, that means people will start, you know, obviously if it's like random anonymous FNMs, it's never going to come back to haunt you. Sure. At, at, like the, at, at events where you start seeing the same people over and over, if you're on the GP circuit or the Star City circuit, you'll start to get that rep and people will start to pay a lot more attention to, well, what's, why, why did he do that? What's that thing he's doing there? Yeah. Um, so I think it actually ends up not helping you as much. It helps you in the moment, but in the long run, it's not actually gonna help you all that much. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, that's fair. I, I mentioned in my earlier video about reputation effects, and you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's funny. It's 
these situations can come up, but what also can come up is, you know, I need an intentional draw with this person and they don't need the intentional draw. And are, are they going to give it to me? And, and that sort of thing comes up too. And so, yeah, that stuff matters. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, the, the person trying the pithing needle trick is taking a big risk because you are wasting a pithing needle if your opponent knows what's what. Yeah, I mean, it, but it, it, I mean, it might be zero risk if you were going to die anyways, but it could, yeah, it could yeah. be risking something. It, it'd be worth taking the shot. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. it yeah. means that so that one, okay, so that was one of the ones where, where the, the, at least the audience, the respondents of that poll kind of agreed with us, so, but it's still an interesting play. This, this next one, I had an interesting discussion with this one, so this, this will be a little, maybe a little bit less or even more gray area. I'm oh. playing Scape Shift. Mm -hmm. I've got two Valakut, six Mountain in play. Only two mountains left in library. Opponents at 13. Me casting scapeshift. I say the phrase scapeshift you out. Mm -hmm. Opponent concedes. Now, is saying scapeshift you out a legal play? Anything, anything the rules has to say about this? The, the rules actually do cover this in the communications. This is, that's just a statement about the future state of the game, and that's totally illegal. Uh, the the totally class illegal. Point that yes, it, escape shift you out is fine. Yeah, okay. because that, that's like saying swing for lethal when you don't actually have lethal on the board. But you have a giant growth in hand. You know, you you are speculating this is lethal damage. I mean, I can swing with a one one for well, while I'm at twenty. Well, you're at twenty. I can swing at you with a one one and go swing for lethal. That's a speculation on future state of the game. Uh, escape shift you out is absolutely make them play it out. Okay, um, and I had. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the number one answer was clean, hundred percent clean play. But a lot, a few people thought this was this was even cheating, or you know, a few other people were all over the map on this. Even though the plurality of players said this is a clean play. Yeah, it's this is back to non-sporting behavior. Okay, and then there's one that I'll, I'll scroll, I'll skip ahead a little bit because there's one that comes up pretty close. I, I remember it. I'll just say it. So this one is a little bit different because opponent has. Graph Digger's Cage in play, which prevents cards in Graveyard from being mm. cast. Yep. I have a Ren and Six Emblem, which gives all spells in my Graveyard retrace. Mm -hmm. I reveal three lands from my hand and point <laughs> to the Lightning Bolt in my Graveyard. Then, the, now, the judge, you know, so then the judge gets called. You, the person, I tell you, I knew... I wasn't able to cast Bolt, but I was hoping that by pointing to it, my opponent would concede. Have I violated the rules? I am pre So the revealing of the three lands, if you say I have three lands, that's fine. Yeah. I think once you point to the lightning bolt, there is an implied action there that makes me makes me really nervous. Um, I am pulling people aside at that point to talk about exactly what's happened. Okay, that, that's how I ruled it too, but now I want, now I want to get into that side conversation because this, this is getting we, interesting. We just stopped agreeing so much. <laughs> yeah, I know, we're, that's the problem. I said the same thing. In my response, I said, for me, that's really all the elements of a shortcut to casting something, right? If I'm revealing how I'm paying for it, pointing to it. Now, you know, someone might respond, well, you can't actually cast all three at once. You didn't tap any mana, so... Is it kind of like scape shift you out? Um, but but no. what kind of questions would you be asking me if we were in that side? You know, now you're asking more questions. What kind of questions would you be asking? I, I, I want to know exactly what it's mostly. I want to establish exact exactly what happened at that point because the question here is, did I cast the spell? Right, right. And actually, the the three isn't actually all that relevant because we do have rules to cover how to cast three spells simultaneously. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, you can legally cast three spells at once, um, and they all resolve individually, but that's a separate shortcut. Um, so I, if, if I believe that you knew that what Digger's play was indicated was preventing you from cast, and you got to a point where I believe you basically attempted to cast a spell, that's, that, that, that's what I'm looking for there, is I am, I am wanting to know exactly what actions you took there, whether you just sort of had, you sort of had generally implied things, or whether you had gotten to a point where you, you know... And and, does that, and, like, my, and I guess, I don't know if this is pushback or just clarification, but do, so does it matter what my, well, what's more important, my intent or the fact that my opponent could reasonably view my actions as having, as trying to cast a spell, right? I mean, you think about intent, like imagine, obviously like if I tap four lands and put Supreme Verdict on the table, but there's not mm -hmm. two white there, 
Like mm-hmm. I can't later say, well, I was just I was just revealing a card for my hand and floating four mana. Uh, yeah. So my intent doesn't save me. So does would my intent save me here? Because look, no, this is this isn't really about intent. This is about did you cross the line? Right. From I'm implying future state to I took actions that pretty clearly demonstrated I was casting a spell. Okay. Uh, I, what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for first of all that you realize the graph diggers cage was in play, which I think we can take as a given here in this scenario. As it sounds like you were. Yeah. And then, and then it's a question of did you take sufficient? Did you cross essentially a, a line where you went from I'm sort of thinking about casting a spell. To, this is this could be reasonably interpreted as I cast a spell. Yeah. One thing I always struggle with as a player, and I'm curious about your, your thoughts as the as the defending player. How do I protect myself without participating in? Is it okay to ask, are you casting Lightning Bolt even though I know they can't cast it? Like, how do I yeah. protect myself? Yeah. You can say, are you casting Lightning Bolt? If they say yes, call a judge. Okay, so, okay. because one thing I've always struggled with is this this example. Mm-hmm. I cast Emrakul the Eon's Torn, which cannot be countered. My yep. opponent says, my opponent targets it with Mana Leak. Um, I've always struggled with, if I go to put, if I call a judge right there, they're just going to say, yep, I know it couldn't be countered. And, and, and I'm never winning that ruling. On the other hand, if I put it in the graveyard, am mm-hmm. I going to be accused of cheating? Because I knew it couldn't be countered, so why am I putting it in the graveyard? Like, how do I protect myself? I've always struggled with that. I never, I never felt right about putting it in the graveyard to, 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 to see if they were cheating or not. And oh, oh, okay. I, I get what you're saying. Because like, you understand, like, if, if I leave it on the stack, my opponent is going to have full recourse to just say like yep i was just trying to get you to concede i didn't actually try to counter or just i was just di- yeah. get, getting rid of the card yeah th- no th- this is i mean this is a deeply problematic area and it's really i mean it there's a lot of you had to be there and a lot of you're right to wrestle with it we wrestle with it too okay um because yes i mean the thing is they they made a legal play up until the point where you put it in the graveyard right um, and you can put it in the graveyard and see if they stop you, and then you could call a judge and we would investigate. Okay, um, but, then, but what I worry about is then, if you ask me why'd you put it in the graveyard, and I say, well, I knew it couldn't be countered, but I was letting it be countered so then I could call a judge, it, it's like, and, well, I'm moving cards from zone to zone against yeah. the rules, and it starts to feel like I'm cheating. I think if you call a judge immediately at that point, we would not worry okay. that much about it. Okay. Um, but you're right. This is, I mean, this is a gray area we've talked about for years. This is like, I mean, we struggle with this, and it's not like we can write any sort of rules that can realistically solve this problem. Because okay. um, now, now, now we're from ambiguity and shortcuts into like straight up is somebody cheating? Yeah, uh, which, and, I, and we kind of stepped through it. Yeah, we kind yeah. of stepped through it, right? And it became it sort of became moved from the simple. Well, this is how the rulings go. To now, now we're in those those horrible situations, which you know, judge, to be fair, none of these situations are new and surprising to me. Judges talk about these all the time because they are deep pain points in judging, and a lot of these are just investigations about intent. But oh, yeah, if I'm you, not even making I'm not even making it up. The Emrakul one is, like, that's from a Pro Tour that I played okay. in. So yeah. <laughs> And I, 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 I mean, I would personally say that if you put it in the graveyard and then pause the second to see if they stopped you, and then call the judge, I and explain why you did that, I'd be like, Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, we're, 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 I'm not going to worry about you. you. You, you had a clear reason for doing the thing you're doing. Yeah. And now we're there. So I think, but, yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to caution. I, I'm going to caution my viewers. Don't don't try too much. I think I think this is in don't try this at home territory, in my opinion, because we got one judge, but that's that's not every judge, and the yeah. penalty for knowingly breaking the rules can be so harsh that I actually think you're better you're better served simply asking the judge away from the table to ask the opponent like what's your what's their mindset and trying to win yeah. the ruling that way by having them slip up. Yep. Just just as a practical note, because I mean you know I agree with you. In a perfect world, but in the world where you might you're gonna get a different judge in a, on a different day of the week, and it may, they may rule differently, it's a little bit and, it's a little bit tricky. I mean, even even beyond that, if you do this slightly wrongly, then right, right. Are, I mean, you are sort of very briefly breaking a rule, which is why I get, get that clear guidance of if you do it and then immediately call a judge and explain why you did it. Yeah, like if you do that slightly wrongly, or you know, you try to use that as an excuse to excuse some other play you made. And, it could go real badly. This, this is, yeah, we're in a deeply advanced stuff. I mean, this is deeply advanced judging topics, but it's also deeply advanced player topics. Oh, for sure. That's this what, is, I always want to bring it back to that. How, yeah. how would you rule, but also how do you protect yourself? Yeah, I, I, I mean, in a lot of these situations, 
there isn't really winning. There, there are you can construct situations in magic in paper magic where the defending player really just is kind of host here. They cannot. I mean, is the guy cheating? Is the guy has the guy missed something? And you will not be able to know. Yeah, uh, it's it it sort of comes with the game. Yeah, uh, there's a couple there's a couple of situations that I, that I've always that have always amused me. Some of them involving like Sylvan Library and Brainstorm. Oh, and having, not a card. Not a card. <laughs> yeah, having to understand having to understand which card you know that kind of what gets tracked. Those are fun. Also, yeah, just I, like the card Vendillion click and uh, trying to understand. How do I let my? How do I stop my opponent at the appropriate time, but not without letting them know that because they have first priority in the draw step? And I've tried to. I've actually yeah. spent more time than is probably healthy thinking about how to get priority in my opponent's draw step without giving them a, like in certain ways. In the, so yeah, oh. these there's just areas where, like you said, it's not a, you can't you can't slice it that thin sometimes. There are multiple horrible things Vendillion Click can do. There's the whole <laughs> Vendillion Click wait for your opponent to reveal their hand and then be like, no, I'm targeting myself. It, it's stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, it, it's Vendillion Click actually causes all kinds of problems. <laughs> <laughs> so is that yeah? Is it, if there was yeah. if, if there's a Hall of Fame for those, there's like you know humility. There's the Hall of Fame of problematic cards. Do you think Vendillion Click's probably on there? Yeah, oh yeah. I, I, I know I wrote a blog post at one point, which was like the five worst triggers of all time, and so <laughs> it's sort of along those lines. Sylvan Library. <laughs> oh, Desecration Demon, I think, was like the top. That one does not work under any like invisible magic structure. But um, um, anyway, so back, but back to that. The answer to most of these situations is the best solution is always to over communicate. That will occasionally leave you strategically slightly disadvantaged, and that is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you'll just have to accept that you can't take that extra. You can protect yourself, but not take that extra. So like in the Emrakul situation, you can protect yourself from the Emrakul just by, okay, it's counter. It can't be countered. Yeah, you can't determine if the guy was cheating. And there's a lot of situations where you'd really love to say, oh yeah, well the guy's cheating here. I can maybe I can catch him, and it just does not work that well. Uh, yeah. There are other situations where you absolutely can, ca yeah. can catch the Freddy, cheating, but. For any for any judges that are watching, I've had this conversation privately with, with a few judges. I want to say it here. Um, one thing is I, to identify, try to identify those situations when they come up, and make sure as a judge you're asking the appropriate question about the player's intent when it's ambiguous whether it's cheating or not. And oftentimes, even though it seems like we've reached a resolution where at this moment both players agree the spell can't be countered, both players agree that that the spell was cast and, and there's kind of not a disagreement about the game state. I would just ask judges to try to think though, however, could the, could that opponent have been intending something different if it wasn't caught? And have I asked that question at least to ask, okay, well, can I ask you this? You know, did you have, were you hoping that it would, that you, were you hoping that the spell would get countered? That's the kind of question where I think you might actually be able to identify when someone isn't playing within the rules. And so just a note there that as a player, I always appreciate a judge that's going to ask that one extra question. Yep. What, you know, what did, why did you do it? What did you expect to happen? What would you have done if the opponent didn't react to it? Yeah, and that sort of situation is pretty, I mean, countering an Emrakul is a, well, it, it's, I would say it's a pretty weird situation, except it's not, because if you forget that Emrakul can't be countered, like, mono leaking is a windmill slam play. Yes, no, and that's, I, right. And it, that's, that's, but this is why you have to you have to pull the player aside and talk about, well, what were you thinking here, why, you know, yeah, go walk. Yeah, and if they say, and, 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 you know, as a player, if, if the opponent says, I didn't, I forgot that it couldn't be countered, <laughs> You know, some spots you're gonna have to take that as you're gonna have to take that yeah. as as at least the you know there's nothing the judge can do, and you know whether you believe them or not. However, it's nice to ask the question and, and have you know at least yeah. force oh, them to have yeah. produce that answer. Sure, and you'd be amazed at the number of questions I've asked players and they've given me just jaw dropping responses. Like yeah. I, I I will have asked the player an intent question like that. I'm like, yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't notice. I'm like, okay, well, let's let's go have a little chat. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it could absolutely be an innocent mistake, but yeah, judges should absolutely be thinking about intent and looking at these plays and being like, and being questioning, well, whether you know, this is kind of odd. What's going on here? Let's let's ask some more questions. Yeah, I want to ask you. Um, this one is an example that has a different distribution of responses among the the folks, the public that responded. So this will be maybe maybe this will take us in a different direction. I have tendrils of agony. I, I put that on the stack. Opponent plays Mind Break Trap. So Tendrils of Agony has Storm, Mind Break Trap, Exiles, 
as many spells as you want or copies of spells. And then, so you play my, I play Tendrils, you play Mind Break Trap, and I say Mind Break Trap resolves. Storm Trigger resolves? Question mark. And so the, the plurality of respondents thought this was more than slightly scummy, quite scummy. Like even trying this is not ethical. Now, from a rules perspective, how are you? How, how would you rule if the Mind Break Trap player says, "Come on, we all know that Mind Break Trap counters all the storm copies," but the other person says, "Well, they didn't say that," and so I'm assuming that they're responding to the trigger. Yeah, no, the, the, we've we've had this ex exact discussion before. This also comes up a lot with um, the demon that brings back copies of itself. Um, the one, the, the one from, was it Shadowmoor? Um, when you play one, return all copies from the graveyard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that's for, for, for five, for five red-black hybrid yeah. mana, that one. If, if I, if I counter that one, do I get the countered copy back? Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. I think in general, in those, I'm, I'm trying to remember where we arrived on that one. Um, I mean... Okay. I, 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 I think that it's sort of, it, this is one where I'd be like, this is one where, and I get in trouble with this occasion, I'm like, this is a raised eyebrow situation where you raise an eyebrow at the player like, really? <laughs> right. And some judges really hate that I occasionally talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is one of those ones where I'd be like, really? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting one. I, I, you know, if there's a rule, you know, I think the what the rule is, you know, when timing's ambiguous, you kind of assume that they're they're responding at their first opportunity, and so that, yeah, that's a general rule. So and the, so I, if I you will were to follow the letter rule, of that. I will lean on that rule if I need to, but there are certain situations where it is so blatant yeah. that I'm I'm like, look, it really. <laughs> so here's what I here's what here's what I would ask if I was if I was ruling this situation. And I'm not a judge, but here's what from a player, you know, here's what I would ask. I would say ask the player casting Mind Break Trap. What did you think? What did you believe the stack looked like when you cast it? And if they said, "I thought I was, I thought there was a bunch of copies of that spell from Storm, and I thought I was mind break trapping it," I think it's, I think it's pretty reasonable within, within, yeah. even, even, you know, to just say like, well, in that case, like, that's where that's legitimately what the player thought they were they were doing, and it's ambiguous, and we're not going to necessarily lean into that rule. That's the earliest possible opportunity, but. You know, I don't know if that's ultimately where you guys came out. We'll have to follow up on that one and figure out exactly what the procedure guide says. It's a, it's a tough one. I, I, I think technically you are responding. I'm trying to think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't have an explicit. I'm trying to think. We, we don't have an explicit. We have one about what you target with it, but that doesn't target. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this is one where the exact technical ruling I would probably overturn and just be like, mm. it, it, you know, you're obviously trying to counter everything. Similarly to the demigod, where it's like, yeah. and, and I, I'll acknowledge for years I like was like, well, technically the demigod comes back, and uh, it's like, I mean, that's triggers are triggers are invisible and weird and challenging and. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my response to the storm player might be, well, how do I know you remembered your trigger? <laughs> yeah, no, right. And so, demigod, the demigod one too. How, yeah. how do I, how do I know that the player had the competency within the rules to do what they yeah. were trying to do? And what, why are you denying me the equity from them not knowing how to operate their cards? It, it's tough. I mean, we're we're into sort of these corners where, yes, the exact explicit document reading may produce a really unintuitive result, and you should probably consider that as part of it. And we don't have explicit guidance about that situation, which says to me that, you know, there's at least a little bit of flexibility to be like, really? Yeah. I want – so I think maybe perhaps the last of these um, – the opponent. So there's this is one about naming a card, and I think there's some specific rules handling. I'm not super familiar, so yeah. I'm curious what the answer is. Okay, opponent controls a windswept teeth and a verdant catacombs, two different fetch lands. I cast yeah. pithing needle, but I announce pithing needle naming verdant catacombs. Um, opponent says, "Hold on a second. With that on the stack, I'll sack my verdant catacombs and mm -hmm. get a forest." And then I say, "Okay, does pithing needle mm -hmm. resolve?" You say, "Yes." You say, "Okay, I'll name windswept teeth." Mm -hmm. 
And I know, so the rules have some kind of default where like announce, it's like if I announce it with a certain thing, it means I'm like, I'm trying to pass through and then name it. But what right. if the opponent interjects with an ability, am I, am I held to that? No, you, uh, that the, there's a shortcut that explicitly says if you announce a choice made on resolution during announcement of the spell, we will hold you to that unless there's a response. Right. So, and so, if, if there's a response, then that's null and void. So this is a, so this is, this is a clean play. Do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's not sporting to try to, to go for this? Or do you think this is just 100% clean? I think this is fine. You have made, you have made a declaration of this is what I intend. And then the game state changes. And so at the time you legally, at the time you are supposed to do this thing, the game state has changed from your original state. Okay. So that's because it's place primarily because the classic one was, I would um, unmask naming black. And you'd be like, oh, I only have blue cards in my hand. And so I reveal my hand, and then you're like, on resolution, I'll name blue. Oh, persecution, yeah. Yeah, yeah persecution, that's right. Yeah. Yes. No, for sure. Uh, and, that and one, so that, I know, so you can't switch it, which is good. I think the rules are set up nicely there. Um, yeah. I, so a, a note for players, though, that the, if you do something in response, they're not going to be held to their choice. Yeah. So just you've got to protect yourself there by sacking I mean, the wind feet as well. Yeah, if I, if I say persecution naming black and you cast three black spells, then I'm like, well, maybe now black's not the right color to name. And that's fine. Right. But... If I say persecution in black and you don't do anything, we are we are sticking you to it. Got it. Okay. Last one, then. This one I found interesting. Okay. You are at nine life. I attack you with a six six trample and two three threes. You block with a four four on the six six. So theoretically, I could be dealing two trample there. Plus mm-hmm. the two unblocked three threes would only be eight. I said you're at nine. Now you ask. Am I dead? And I I point to the trample creature and say trample. In response to the question, am I dead? I say trample, and you concede. It, has anyone broken the rules here? So it would be eight if we actually did. You just pointed and said that has trample. So you have you have not answered the question asked. Correct. Which is legal. <laughs> okay, so it's it's legal to. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you, have not, you have not asserted that they are dead. You have pointed out a fact about the game, and they have drawn conclusions. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, like, by, you know, by the conventions of, of how we converse, certainly I've said you're dead, but I haven't explicitly said it, right? I've said, yeah, so I've kind of said a non sequitur, right? So the way I responded yes. in the thread, I said, it feels unethical to me because it's exploiting an ambiguity between yes, because of trample, and trample non sequitur and i'm kind of exploiting the ambiguity but whether whether it's you know sporting or or not sporting we agree within the rules it's just you're allowed to you're allowed to answer a question with a non sequitur essentially you, 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 the, we, we, in the communication guidelines we define information that you are required to answer directly and then stuff you are not required to answer but you can't lie about so if i well it, so is yes is yes, yes appropriate it's, it's, Right out. Am I dead? Yes, that is definitely not allowed. That's not allowed. Yes, because you have now made a statement that is untrue. <laughs> Whereas, am I dead? Well, this has trample. Is not actually made any untrue statements. Okay. Yeah, that's you know, twenty five percent of respondents felt that way from a ethics perspective. Again, they, they weren't yeah, no, the rules. To be clear, I don't love that. Yeah, of <laughs> uh, course. But, so. But, um, commu- the communication rules are actually a surprisingly sturdy infrastructure, and every time somebody tries to like mess with them and make things like that illegal, it goes horribly wrong. It turns out um, the, this is where we get into that whole you know the comprehensive rules is mathematical, but the rest of the documents have to be sort of more generalized. Yeah, there are so many. If we set a specific rule about what you could and couldn't say, all that would happen then is the players who wanted to abuse that would figure out exactly where that line was. <laughs> and and other and if you get into situations where you start making it illegal to do these things, um, if I if you play let's say uh, some random card and I say what's that do, and you say well it's a, it, it's a two two it's a vanilla two two, I can I call a judge and say he didn't tell me it was a bear, mm. and so that that's the sort of the core communication problem is once you start really locking down, yeah. you answer these questions. Then it actually goes. It flips the other way, and people can start to get you because you failed to do that, even though in good conscience you gave the information they actually needed at that time. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I'm always fascinated to talk communication guidelines with people because the communication guidelines are really interesting. 
Um, but they are surprisingly hard to modify. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah, and, and that's a lot of times I think people have an intuition with ethics too. I was engaging on the ethics things, and the people who you end up in a situation. Maybe it's a corner case. Maybe it's a it's a core case where you have a strong intuition about how it should be resolved. But then you realize if I resolve it that way, it has other effects. Like for example, mm-hmm. now maybe I'm not now I'm not. No one can ever forget the creature has trample. Like that's an maybe an effect. Maybe unintended. Maybe intended. Like you're right. talking about communication. If I, if I do it that way, then maybe people who are just not skilled at answering questions, maybe now they get held to account for things that they shouldn't. I yeah. think those are all, so, it's always important to think about those, those knock-on effects. Yeah, and, and the only way to sort of resolve that particular Gordian knot is to basically toss up your hands and be like, the judge can decide. And that provides the players with nothing. And so you, can, you could get penalized for something that was totally fine last week. Yeah, um, I was actually... I was, in, in that 2012 thread, we were talking about the trample rules, and it, it was actually, what I had commented about was not this exact thing, but that we're talking about today. It was actually, should we be more prescriptive with how far we can back up? And, and, mm. and you articulated the position that, well, a turn is not a turn, a phase is not a phase. There are some phases that pass in a blink of an eye. There are some phases that involve casting 20 spells, and we don't right. really want to treat them the same. And I was just saying, well, but at the same time, you know, bright lines are helpful too. And that, and oh, so, yeah. oh, I, I love. I mean, I love bright lines. I'm a judge and a policy writer. If I could write bright <laughs> lines for everything, I would. I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. But you know, there's a reason that the legal code of the U.S. is how many volumes. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and it and, and still and we still pay lawyers how much money to sort out all the ambiguity in them. Um, well, that's why there's, that's why it's so complicated. Yeah. Me- meanwhile, the IPG is a like twenty page document that has to encompass everything that any player could ever do inside a tournament. I think I mean I actually love the communication section because for the page and a half that it de- is devoted to that section, it is actually a really good infrastructure that provides answers to almost all situations. Yeah. Most of the, there are some ones where you're like, ah, oh, I wish it wasn't that way. But then you then you try to make it not that way, and it turns out that that's just worse. Yeah, and, and I and I want to give a shout out also because it's you know we've argued about well I'm I'm trying to say I don't want the judges to have I want the judges to have as little discretion as possible because therein lies a problem. I don't know what I'm going to get when I call the judge. I'm kind of at the mercy of who happens to walk over, and oftentimes I may have a I may have a relationship or you know the person across from me may have a relationship with the judge, and discretion is problematic. We all know why. Yep. At the same time, I want to give a shout out. I mean, in practice, I've called a judge so many times over so many years. That discretion is actually has been used. I mean, appropriately, fairly, thoughtfully, the vast majority of the time. And so I think you know the judges do a great job. I want to just give a shout out and 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 just a note for the players that who are of my mindset. Well, I don't know exactly how the judge is going to rule. You know, learn how to kind of. Give the judge, arm the judge with the facts they need in order to make sense of what's happening, in order to under, even and even to hint at what a fair outcome would be. And mm-hmm. in my experience, you're gonna you're gonna be impressed most of the time with how the judges use the discretion to kind of unpack what's going on. Just a note there, I wanted to make sure I got in. Yeah, I, I mean the frameworks we have in place really do work for the ninety nine percent cases, and then there are then we acknowledge that there's a one percent where. It, you got to just be human and yeah. look at it and be like, well, what makes sense? We don't have philosophical guidance here because this is crazy. What makes sense? Yeah. Um, and and my, my personal stance, I, there are judges who disagree. There are judges who would really like another 30 pages in the IPG. And I'm like, it, the, ben, the cost benefit of those 30 pages just isn't there. Um, what we've got right now lets judges rule fairly consistently throughout the world. Yeah. Um, on all but the weirdest of corner cases, and those corner cases, and you hear about those corner cases because judges love to talk about corner cases. The players course, probably yeah. love to talk about corner cases too. But yeah, I mean, the guidelines we have don't handle those weird corner cases. But the rest, um, you'll get at least a good consistency. And I have no problem saying, yeah, in that weird tiny percentage of the time, I trust the judge to make an appropriate ruling. Yeah. All right. So that that's fair. I think, um, you know. I- I wanted to, I appreciate, you know, I want to wrap it up, but I want to, before we do, just um, ask you, what's the right forum for people who, let's say they're, they're feeling like I felt, hey, I want to have a conversation or I want to explain that it feels weird to me that, that my opponent was able to kind of 
do this or that with communication or what they said. I don't know if that was right or wrong. What's the right way for them to raise an issue or first, first ask a question and second, what's the right way to say, hey, is, it, is this the right procedure? I mean, there, there are a few ways to do it. Um, you can always go through wizards. Um, I mean, Wizards cares about all this stuff deeply, um, mm. and the, you know, I work with. It's not like I'm out here solo producing tournament documents. That'd be awesome. Sure. But <laughs> I'm, I'm working. I'm working with Scott Larrabee and the team at Wizards to um, do, who does organized play to produce these documents. So you can go through the standard like channels, the Wizards channels, the customer feedback and stuff, and okay. it will eventually get to Scott and most of the time get to me unless he can handle it directly. Um, I'm mostly off of Twitter nowadays. Um, when I took the last job, I had to cut a social media, and it was that one. Um, you can find uh, my blog is linked from the very like the ju- uh, the judge blogs there. Um, the best way to get hold of me at, in that sort of situation is to you can send me messages through the judge center, and okay. I, I will get the emails. Um, that is probably the easiest way. If you post on my judge blog. Um, the judge blog gets linked from Wizards every quarter when we do the policy updates. I'll link to it in the I'll link to it in the description as well. I, I I'll give the caveat there that there's a sort of decay decay wave on how fast I respond to posts. So like the first week after a a, a policy update, I'll be checking, I'll be checking, and then I'll slowly you know forget to check, and I forget, and then, and then I'll come back for the next post. Like oh no, there's four there from the last month. I just never even noticed. Um, <laughs> so. If you do post on the blog post, um, understand that I may not get to it until the next update if you post like well away from an update. Fair if you enough. Post, okay. And, and if nothing else works, send it to me on Twitter and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you my two cents on it. And if, yeah, <laughs> if I agree that it's worth Toby's time, I'll, I'll pass it along. Matt can certainly get hold of me. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, I'm available. And yeah, generally, if you send me an email to the Judge Center, it's probably the most efficient way to do it. Okay, great. Well, Toby, I appreciate the time as always. Um, ah, come on. Yeah, your patience with me over the years, much appreciated as it was today. And, uh, you know, anytime. Anytime you want to hop back on with the, with the next, you know, hot button issue, we'd love <laughs> we'll, to have you on. We'll see what it is. So this is Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players. Today we got into judging, but we kept it, we kept the flavor of if you're at the table, you got to know this stuff too. I think judges have to learn how to think like players, competitive players. You got to learn how to think like a judge. So I appreciate this exchange uh, for my viewers t- towards that end. So again, thanks. Uh, and I'll catch you next time.